which is probably wrong. We'll, we'll give you at least two weeks. Uh, now, I just realized that I don't have my HDMI uh, dongle. If anybody has one of these new MacBooks with the USB-C port, an HDMI adapter, or any adapter that will fit into the projector. I don't know, I think somebody took it from my bag and put it back. Thanks. Make sure to get it back. from the data set. Not necessarily. Not forced to pick those centroids from data, but let's do it. We have a loop, right? So there is a step that says uh, computer membership. Once I have this K centroids, let's call them mu1, mu2, up to mu k. Computer membership, that is, uh, we call this pi. I realize now, today, that that's not the right notation I wanted to use. But since we used it last week, I don't want to confuse you guys. We'll stick with this. The notes have a different notation. Let's see, maybe one of the TAs can pick the notes to have the same notation. So what was it? was pi ik, right, was what? One, if data point i belongs to cluster k and zero otherwise. So how did we choose for each data point which cluster it goes to, which partition it goes to? It's the one that's closest to it, right? So we said pi i k is one if and only if uh, k, the cluster, is what people call arc min, right? The minimum that realizes the distance from the point xi to all uh, clusters, all centroids. So this K, it's a little bit of abusive notation here. It's saying you look at the one that gives you the minimum distance. Look at all centroids. I is fixed in here. Look at all centroids. Whenever you get the minimum distance, that's the K you want. So this, I think we call it what, E step? And then 
we have another step that says what? It's the other way. Now that I have the membership, so you could say here, given mu's, assuming mu's are fixed. Now I have another step that says, given phi's, the memberships are fixed now. Compute or recompute the centroids. So that goes like what? Every mu k was the average, right? So it's the average of xi belongs to cluster k, which is how do we compute that? We have to do a sum over all the data points, right? But consider only the ones that belongs to that cluster k. So I'm going to multiply here with pi i k. Say, if x i is in that cluster, contributes 1. If it's not in that cluster, it's a 0. And I have to divide by how many things are in that cluster, like an average. So that's the sum of pi i k. That's going to count as a count of how many things went to that cluster. This sum here is over i, right? Because k is fixed in this equation. And we call this the? <coughs> the problem? M step. M step. Now, a e step and m step are not as, as set in stone as we would like them to be. Both in terms of EM has so a lot of applications. This is just one of them. And because people think of optimization from a theoretical perspective slightly a different way, I won't insist on which one is the E step and which one is the M step at all. But I will insist on the nature of this loop. Why is it looping? You can call it step one and step two, step A and step B. You can admit to me, I don't know which one's the E step. That's fine. Even me, I'm not sure sometimes. You know? but, but the loop is important. And um, what was the objective? So this is the algorithm, right? And it, it goes until convergence. Convergence, that means uh, no change. If either one of these steps produces no change, then the next one will produce no change because they depend on the previous one and so on and so forth. Like for example, if memberships are all the same like before, the centroids will be the same as before, which means the memberships will be the same as before. Now, what is our um, objective here? So now, now, I think most people will understand what, why this stuff works. We will not use convergence always, right? There will be a case that the centroid might be switching between two points. So Excellent question. That's what I'm about to say. Perfect time. So what was the objective? I think it was uh, something like minimize, right? Uh, what was it? Was the sum for all the data points in all clusters, something like that, right? Of, um, was it the distance between the xi? I think it was, yeah, like was it some sort of distance? Let me see if I remember. Xi and mu k from all i and k. And of course, we care about distances only when i belongs to that cluster, right? So, what this formula is saying, I want you to arrange those points in clusters somehow. Keep in mind that k is fixed in here. k is given 10, or 5, or 11, right? Such that once you're done arranging. This is a partition because it's hard clustering. Every data point goes exactly to one of the clusters. Once you're done, inside each cluster, right? We can break this sum per cluster. Inside each cluster, the distance between xi to mu k should be uh, minimized. So in other words, if I could take one point, say I put it into one cluster. It has certain distance, distance equal 10. So if a point here, this is an xi, it's associated with a mu 2, say, and distance is 10. 
If I could move this to another mu, mu5, with distance h, should I do that? How, how this formula change? If I take a point and say, instead of going to that cluster, you go to this cluster. It's a smaller distance. Am I guaranteed to improve this minimum here? That's right. Because this distance appears in the sum somewhere for cluster 2. It's deleted from there. And then instead it's going to be added into the other cluster, which is cluster 5, the smaller distance. So I delete a 10, I add an 8, means I lower my objective. All machine learning problems, unsupervised and supervised, in fact, all data problems, sooner or later they have something that's called objective. And some of these objectives are used for evaluation purpose only, like what's your loss or objective. Sometimes they call loss or likelihood, right? Or but sometimes algorithms use them internally. They specifically do whatever they do inside to try to minimize this function. Okay? Most machine learning algorithms will work that way. They design their process based on some theory that's gonna optimize that function. They wanna maximize or minimize or whatever. So your problem one in homework two which is still a mystery because you haven't seen it, right? Is a theoretical problem on paper. You will still submit it through Dropbox. You have to scan that paper, take a picture, anything. But you, you won't submit it as a paper, so it's still a PDF, sort of speak, or a JPEG. Is to say, suppose I have this objective, right? I want to prove, now I'm answering your question. What I want to prove is that each step, the objective goes down. In other words, once I start with some mu's, initialization is a matter of debate. We can do randomly, we can do part as we discussed this last time, right? We can pick points part apart, maybe that's a good idea. We can pick them maybe a sampling from a distribution to make sure we pick points in a large density. There's many good ideas, but initialization is not part of the main loop. Let's assume we've done initialization. But I, after the initialization, I, can I compute this objective? What do I have after initialization? I have the centers. Can I compute this? No, because I don't have the pies. Right? So I need to run this step here, compute the membership. Once I compute this step, that's going to give me an objective value, right? Say objective equals some value. And now I start looping this step, then that step, then this step, then that step. What you have to prove is that each one of these steps, given fixed mu's, recompute the pi's, and given fixed pi's, recompute the mu's, cannot possibly increase this objective. Okay? So that means to say, um, you have to prove it for Euclidean distance, but you can do it for other distances too. So how do I write this for Euclidean distance? Sum for ik, that's going to be the norm of xi minus mu k, that the Euclidean norm, right? This is called sometimes least square optimization, like in regression. Sometimes maybe you heard of sum of square errors, same thing. All those things come the same. Now, how would I prove something like if mu's are fixed? Um, well, I want you to prove two things. One is what I said, the objective goes down. But not just that, I want to prove a little harder thing. That is that mu is fixed, I can achieve a global minimum of this function, global minimum. That is the best possible minimum given these mu's. So mu's are fixed here, I can't change the mu's. What I can do? Change the pi's. This, I want you to prove that the best possible pies you could get, it's gonna be exactly the pies that minimize those distances. Now, that's not a global, global minimum because it's fixed, fixed mu's, right? So then the next step says, now fixing the pies, the best you can do to minimize this thing is to compute, uh, <laughs> mu's exactly this way. So in other words, 
both these things are realizing a local optimum. This one saying, given the current mu's, the minimum of this function is realized by these pi's. And this one saying, given this particular pi's, the minimum of this function of mu's is realized by this particular function. So at every step, we take the minimum we can, but we may not reach quickly to the global optimum. But that, I think, answers the question, why is it that's going to converge eventually? Why is it that this thing cannot postulate forever? You know, sometimes, maybe you've heard of Markov chains. They kind of can be periodic, they oscillate. Why is this not possible here? If I reduce this, this value all the time, I can't oscillate, because oscillating means at some point it's going to go upward than, than it was before, right? So I think both are trying to minimize independently, and both minimum may be in conflict. Right. The minimum may never be the global minimum, but the global objective always goes down. Okay? Always goes down. Now, to be theoretically perfect on that argument, the number of possible configurations is finite. Is that true? The number of total possible of centroids and memberships, all possible clusterings and partition, I claim it's a finite number. You know, in calculus, somehow, you can minimize and minimize and minimize, but never reach the actual minimum. You ever did that when you did limits? Like, it just keeps going forever, right? And you wonder, how can you can always go down, but never reach to that point? Calculus happens. That can happen because there's an infinite number of steps, right? What I'm arguing is that in here, there cannot be, that's a pure theory, has nothing to do with practice. The number of possible partitions and centroids is very big, but it's finite, right? How many total partitions are for n data points into k things? Hmm? If I'm asking you, I have 70 students, I want to form four groups. Group one, group two, group three, group four. How many total theoretical number of possibilities I have to put those students into four groups? Hmm? No. Each student can go into how many groups? Four. So first student has four options. Second student has four options. Third student has four options. So the total number of options is four to the seventy. Now, of course, that's a huge number in theory. We're never going to try any brute force attempt to say evaluate all of them and see what happens. But it satisfies this argument. You cannot go infinitely down with the minimum because there's only a finite number of positions. At some point, it's going to have to stop or go up. But if you prove it never goes up, then it must converge at some point. OK? I don't get how you want to like, want to prove mathematically. Like, how do you so the proof that you're going to be required to do is to say, if I have this equation and I fix the mu's, so mu's are coefficients, they are given to you. Data points, of course, are given to you. Prove that this, uh, this, uh, this equation here, this assignment, realizes the minimum. If you are to pick the pies, you can send every data point to every cluster you want. In order to minimize this function for given mu's, so mu's you cannot change, this assignment here realizes the minimum. Like out of all possible assignments, this is the one that gives the minimum objective value. And the other way from the other part, which is given the pi's are fixed now, but you can pick the mu's, mu's are the variables. If you want the minimum of this function, minimum possible, the right mu's to use are those ones right here. This is very easily done. Both of these are very mathematically, very easy exercises. This one, you can prove simply by an argument like in any other cluster, the distance will be bigger. So why not choose the closest one? That's going to minimize this. This one, you can easily do with a differential. If you take this equation, the variables being the mu, the mu's here, if I differentiate it, this is going to be where the differential is 0. That's the minimum. That's how they prove the regression uh, algorithm. All right. So that's what we've done last time, right? And we, we've done one more thing that was saying, 
uh, why, why this approach? Why was the, what's the intuition of this? So mathematically, it makes sense. K means you're going to run it for the homework. Uh, we looked at something I call nature. And I said, in nature, many things come distributed around the center. So I'm going to say, here's the center, right? And I'm going to call this mu. In statistics, it's called mean. We can call it centroid, because mean and centroid means the same thing. It's an average. Now, sometimes you have to be careful here. I said this before. Uh, some data points do not average that easily. This, this algorithm assumes that the average makes sense. In ma many cases, that if you have salaries, you have ages, you have, you know, uh, I don't know, pixel colors, maybe you can average them. But be careful not to average without thinking. Does it make sense to average those things? And the other thing that matters here in this distribution is this variance, right? How wide it is. Now, this is, of course, a very nice and smooth mathematical model. But why people like it so much? One reason is the mathematics of it is very well known, very well developed, and relatively simple. Okay, so math, math is nice with those things. Uh, the other reason is that, to some degree, corresponds to nature around the center. So it has been observed that many natural phenomena, all kinds of sampling, weather events, you know, population migration, uh, income inequality, you name it, has this property that a lot of values are around the center. So like I said before, this is values, and this is frequencies, right? So how often they happen. So if I look at ages in this class, for example, I bet that most ages, your, you guys age in years, it's around the center. If the average age is, I don't know, 24, most of you are close to 24. Um, if the average house price in Boston is half a million dollars, most houses will be around that, that net thing, half a million dollars. You know? If the average GPA for master students is what? 3.5, most people would be around 3.5, okay? So naturally, if the, if the leaves falls on average around October 20th from trees, that means most leaves will fall around October 20th. That's not the property of the average. I could have the average age be 24 in this class, but have the ages distributed all over the place, right? I mean, the average alone doesn't say most values have to be close to the average. The average is just what happens to be the sum divided by the count, right? So can anybody give me a natural example where there is an average, but it's not the case that most values are distributed around the average? It's cute, right? I mean, that's one average way. I want an actual example. I, I know that that's what you should expect. But can you give me an example coming from nature where there is an average, but it's not this kind of distribution. Like the values, most values are not around the center. Income per capita. Hmm? Income per capita. Income per capita. Income per capita. I think that fits in here. Because what's, uh, say, the, uh, the average income or salary, right? In the United States is what? $40,000, maybe? I say most people will be around $40,000. Now, of course, there's always these tales, right? There's some people very poor and some people very rich. But if I, my guess is that I'm not into demographics and, and census, but my guess is that if the average is about $40,000 per capita, I'm not sure that's correct. I just made that up, OK? My guess, if I look at the data, most people would be around 40000 I expect very few rich people and very few poor people. So what's a natural example where there is an average but the uh, distribution is not at all around the average. If you take an electromagnetic spectrum, and if you take the wavelength, so spread across all over the place, then average might not be where it actually spread. Sure. I mean, you have to know quite a bit of physics to, to make sense <laughs> of what he said. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe yeah, he's yeah, right, right? Can yeah. anybody give me a natural example? Flip a coin. What? Flip a coin. Flip a coin. Say you associate, say, zero with heads and one with the? Tail. That's a very good example, right? So what's the average if he doesn't count heads and tails, he counts 0, 1. It's not a natural average in the sense that the average here is not natural. 
right? So that's the only problem with this example. The average, you're going to say 0 0.5, but really there is no average of heads and tails. But let's say there is 0 0.5. Most flips, in fact, all flips will be either zeros or ones, right? So the average is 0 0.5, but there's nothing around 0 0.5. The flips are actually 0, 1. Anybody else? Temperature. Temperature. Is temperature an example of this? Say the average temperature, say not in the world, but say in Boston, is what? 10 degrees? Is it the case that most days we have temperatures in Fahrenheit around 10 degrees? No, the example is good. If you look at the year, at the particular location like Boston, the temperature, maybe the average is about five to 10 degrees, all the way from minus 40, where we had, to plus 90. But if you look now at all specific day temperatures, not most of them are around 10 degrees, right? That's what he means. How about if I take a place like San Francisco? Is in San Francisco the case that most temperatures are closer to the average than in Boston? Yes, because they have a much more stable climate. Yes? I mean, population in a community, uh, let's say, uh, if you compare the population of Boston and uh, California and Pennsylvania, like Pennsylvania. But what are the values? You, the mean could be uh, like a million, but then there could be about 600,000 people in California than the other two places. You mean the density of the population, how counts of population per city? I don't think this is a good example because I think if there's an average city size in terms of numbers for the United States, so there's of course big cities and more cities, but there's a lot of them, right? Say the average city is about, say what, 50,000 people? The average will be about 50,000? I think most places will be kind of like 50,000. There will be of course some very few big, big places and some very few very small places, but I would guess, I don't know, that's something we can look up. It's, it's true that most cities or more town, most towns in the United States have about the average population. The natural example I, I had in mind last time was the reviews. When people post reviews for movies or songs or anything, the average is always about like three, right? Between one to five, it's about three. But very few reviews are actually three. In fact, most of them are ones and fives because people only post things they like or don't like and nothing, they don't have a gradation. Well, people are like three, they're like, what's the point of posting, right? <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So I think you get this idea. Now, I wanna say something that it's important for data science. Natural phenomena have this thing around the center, but very rarely around the tails. If you study the tails, like the very rich people, the very poor people, severe diseases, you know, old, you know, very rarely those tails are the same. See, in a Gaussian function, they're symmetric to the mean. There's always a tail, that's all right. Oh, the tail always goes down this way. Very rarely you'll see a tail that goes down the other way. But many, many times, one tail is abrupt and the other one is like loose. So when you start looking at tails in medical <laughs> domain, for example, you won't have this symmetry that Gaussian imposes to you. So that's a good observation to know about it when you work with data. If you care about the dense area, the volume, volume is typically around the mean. So Gaussians work well to, to model the middle part, but not so well to model the actual tail distributions. We call tail this when data starts being rare and sparse. Okay, so now the job for today is to say, Huh, we need to make this more interesting. So we're gonna start adding concepts today and more mathematical details on Wednesday. One concept we want is um, soft membership. So soft membership k-means. You can still call it k-means, soft k-means. Uh, most people call it Mixtures, clustering, um, 
so how would this work? The basic, basic concept here is that pi i k is not a black and white thing anymore. It's not either there or there. Pi i k becomes a, a sort of, um, we're going to still say pi i k is either 0 or 1. That's more mathematical. But we're not going to think of this that way. This is going to be like before, but it's a hidden variable. So this is unknown. So that, that to, to match statistics, because you guys have to get some training into how to think statistically about the data. You really want to think intuitively of it as a distribution, right? So we're going to call it pi i k in brackets, or if you prefer expected value of pi i k. It's good. So this is a random variable. If you took a class in properties and statistics, you know there's these variables which they have a value, but you don't know it. They could have possible values. So the possible values are either 0, 1. Uh, but expected value of it, you can think of the probability that pi i k is 1. So I always think of this memberships as distributionals. This is a data point. It has a 20% chance to come from here, 50% chance to come from here, and 30% chance to come from here. I think of it as a distribution that sums to one. So we can add that in here, the sum for all components for a fixed data point. The sum of these pi i k's probabilities will have to sum to one, because each data point as a distribution over the clusters it belongs to. But to make work the statistics, they have this random variable. You can think of it as the source. You don't know where this point came, comes from. And once you do your, your algorithmic, your math, you come up with those properties. It may come from there, from there, from there, but I don't know. For example, suppose, uh, I look at my, my, my class here, 70 students, right? And I look at programming skills. Say from a scale from zero, hopefully we have nothing there. <laughs> and 10, right? Those would be the experts who are super programmers, right? That, that, that's the programming skills, zero to 10, and this is the frequency, right? Just like before. Now, the truth, the reality, or the generation, how it's called in statistics, the generation of this data is that you guys come from two different places. The, some of you are CS students, and some of you are data science students, right? It is a well-known fact, I hope I'm not offending anybody, that CS people would have a higher average programming skill. Uh, I, I don't mean to say that's good or bad. I mean to say, statistically speaking, we looked at the past 10 years of data, that's the case, right? But it doesn't mean that every single CS person is a better programmer than every single data science person, right? It's just an average. In fact, we've seen some data science people which are very, very good at it. Some of your TAs are specifically recruited from the data science previous courses because they did extremely well at programming. So what happens here? Say there is a mu for one category. This is the mu from, from data science somewhere. And there is a, uh, like oh, oh, everything in nature, probably there is some, a lot of people are around the mean. If the average data science programming skill is blank, most people probably are around that blank. So there's a distribution here, right? Around this mean. Let's say the data science has more variation, right? More variations means a flatter Gaussian, something like that. That's the programming skill. Now, computer science have, a, on average, a better skill, but perhaps a less variance. So say the, the, the muse for computer science is here, but this Gaussian is here. So what's going to happen if they're going to do a very good picture here. 
you're going to intersect this way, the, the sharper the Gaussian goes, the faster it goes down. Because the sum, the integral inside has to be one. 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 That's true for any density distribution, right? Good. So now, this is how the registrar assigned students to me. Presumably, I could think of a data science people sample from this distribution. And the computer science people sample from this distribution. But I don't know who's data science, who's computer science. For me, I get the person, and by the end of the term, I'm going to know that person, specifically you, programming skill. So what am I going to know at the end of the term for a particular data point, for a particular student? I'm going to know this value, the x value. Right? I'm going to know at the end of the term, the, the, uh, the, the the person that I'm looking at it has this programming skill right here. Am I going to know, based on this point, whether it's a DS student or a CS student? It could come from this distribution, right? or it could come from this distribution. What about if I see a point, a data a, 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 a student with this programming skill? could still theoretically come from CS, but it's more likely from DS, right? What about here, if I'm here? In here, the, the CS is lower than the DS. So you see how if this Gaussian truly reflects the distribution of programming skills in data science, even at the very end, the DS probability or frequency is actually higher. I'm not saying that's reality, I'm saying this is what happens with Gaussians. Gaussians are forced to be symmetric, and if it's sharp or somewhere, it has to go down faster than the other one. Every Gaussian to the right that's sharper will go down under the Gaussian inside. You can prove that very easily with the formula. How about in here, if I see somebody in here? This is the probability to be a DS student, and this is the probability to be a CS student. Again, those models will never always reflect reality perfectly. That's why they are models. Why are we using those models? Because they're easy to use mathematically with. In reality, no programming skills, diseases, data, leaves falling, salaries would follow a nice, perfect mathematical model. None of them. In fact, people have studied a lot of this notion of complexity trade-off how much more complex I'm willing to make my models to model the data better, but I'm, I'm going to need a lot more computation to deal with them. This is an ongoing problem in data science. The more complex you make the models, the more you, you can model data, but then it takes much more computation to figure them out. You use simpler model like this, computation's easier, but then not, not, model, not going to model the, all the data very well. Okay. So I can do this for so many examples where I, what I actually notice in, in, my, in my data, I wouldn't know how it's generated, but I'm going to know the overall distribution, which is not something like this. This is the overall distribution. Let's, uh, make it. So this is what I notice. This is the distribution of what? this dotted line. It's still a frequency versus value distribution. But what is it? So this dotted one, which is not a Gaussian function. You see how it's funny? What is this? This is the overall histogram of programming skills versus frequency in all my data sets. Right? So this is, if you want, the histogram or density, or sometimes it's called PDF. It stands for what? Okay, let's make sure everybody knows that term, PDF. Okay, of entire population. Sometimes in statistics, when we say population, we don't mean people. We mean population of data. So. The advantage of using something like two Gaussians here, if I know there's two big groups, but I could use five Gaussians if I know there's five groups, is that the overall shape of this distribution can be modeled much better with two Gaussians than with one Gaussian. Right? 
there will be no way to fit a nice one Gaussian to model this. But if I allow two Gaussian or three Gaussians or five Gaussians, then I can model this much better. Of course, the more Gaussians I add, the more complicated the problem becomes. That's the same like in k-means. There is no good way to fix k in advance. You either have to have domain knowledge, like if I know the people come from two groups, I can choose k equal to, or trial and error. I pick a bunch of k's, and I figure out which one seems to work better. Now, that's one story that without any math yet, I can, I, I, I hope I made the argument that while some data fits into this one ball, some things that were naturally grouped from different sources, you may need more bells. This is called a bell distribution or normal distribution. You may need more bells to fit it in. How many people with me on that non-mathematical argument? Hands up so I can see them. Good. We're going to eventually, we're going to have to put some math formulas on the board, right? Yeah, it's unescapable to do that. So uh, anybody knows the formula for this function? This f, also called the normal, is this 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 funny n of mean mean variance or sigma and uh, x, right? I mean x is the value. So this is x. This is f of x. So what is the formula for what is the normal of a given mean sigma square in a point x? <coughs> One over what? Square root of phi sigma square. I think it's sigma square inside the root, or you can take the sigma without square root outside, right? And then? E raised to? X minus mean, right? E raised to the square. What? E raised to the square. E to the power minus of X minus mu divided by sigma. So E to the power minus sigma. X minus mu divided by sigma. Uh, divide by sigma here? Divided by two sigma. Two sigma square? Just sigma? Yeah, the Z square. So it's H minus mu. I think there's a minus here, square like that. Is that right? Is that right? We should check it out. Gaussian for normal distribution. Anybody remembers this? No? Can anybody check it out? Is that correct? Yes. Two sigma squares in here? Um, okay. So now, why do I act like a clown, right? The actual formula is very important when you deal with the mathematical side of things. So all this stuff, not just machine uh, data mining, but machine learning too, has a conceptual part of what is it that I'm doing and why am I doing it, and then a mathematical derivation part that says, okay, now you have to go down to business, differentials, optimization, mean, max, gradient descent, whatever you need. For that part, you have to use the correct formulas. What I want to emphasize here is the conceptual part, that is, even without paying attention to what exactly sigma is, you should have a sense of why this formula looks like that. Okay. So that's the PDF. There is a CDF that accumulates the integral of this up to some point. What about in here? If I have two Gaussians, right? So I'm going to say this is mu 1, this is mu 2, right? And this in here is sigma 1, how wide this guy is. And this is sigma 2. Right? So I have two Gaussians. And I kind of want to combine them. How do I do that? So what is f of x in here? Still a density, and this is f. This dotted one is f. How do I say my f is not one Gaussian, but it's two Gaussians now? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, Wouldn't it just be a sum? Let's uh, start with the sum. That's a good idea. So it's mu 1 sigma 1 squared in x, right? That's the first one. Plus the other one, mu 2 um, sigma 2 squared in x. So we're talking about what's the value in a, day, in a point, right? If this is x right here, what is this f of x? That's what we, we're asking, right? f of x is the piece from here to here. And he's saying is the sum of the two. Now, this is one of them, right, right here, right, up to this point. And the other one is where? The other one is right here, right? So this one that hits one of the Gaussian is one of the normal, I think the second one. And the other segment that hits the first Gaussian is the first one, right? So the problem is the sum will certainly not be a distribution, right? Because the, the integral sums to 2, not to 1. Right? Because one integral from one part sums to 1, the other one sums to 1. So this, it needs something to be a density. What people do, they add some coefficients. They say, I'm going to have a particular w1 value for this and W2 value for that. Those Ws are fixed. So W1, W2, I'll call mixture coefficients. And they sum to Is that there? Yes. Okay. If you combine two distributions, with weights that sum to one. So the, the weighting, the mixture coefficient, say 20% this one and 80% that one, you can easily check that the result is a density function. Because the integral would be the integral of this times W1. That's W1 because W1 times one, plus the integral of this times W2, this be W1 plus W2 would be one, and it has all the nice properties. It never goes negative, right? Because this one's not negative, this one's not negative. It's all a nice density function. Easy to check. So this is called a mixture. Now, this is a mixture of Gaussian functions because the internal distributions of it are Gaussians. But if you want to mix say Poisson distribution or exponential distribution or an exponential and a Gaussian or a Gaussian with a gamma function, whatever distributions you want, the mixture mechanism works exactly the same way. You have a coefficient times the first one, times coefficient of the second one. The coefficients, very important, the coefficients, say W1, does not depend on x. So it's not like a coefficient for every data point. Like for this data point, is 80% that plus 20% that. And for a different data point, is different coefficient times that. The coefficients are fixed. But it's up to you to determine what are the right coefficients. So it's part of the algorithm to figure out what's the right weightage here. But once you find the weightage, those are fixed values. Now, but we have another concept hidden in here, which is what is this? So mu one sigma one square x. Because because it's it's the density function, it's of course like in there, the probability that x belongs to that guy. That uh, say Category or how to say this? Generation. Um, I don't know what the right name here is. Yeah. Group one. We say it's one 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 group one. Statistically, we say that's the probability that x is generated 
by that mechanism. So when we use modeling, we all always assume the data comes generated from some nice mathematical function. Now that's not true, of course, but that's what we assume. In here, we have two generators, the data science and the computer science. And every student we know comes exactly from one of them, but we don't know which one. So when we select a student, there's a probability that being generated from this mechanism, or there's a probability that's being generated from this mechanism. Those will be the two probabilities. Now, those two probabilities don't have to sum to one. Those are, those are not the membership probabilities, if you like. Those are saying there is a certain chance to come from that probability and a certain chance to come to that probability. Um, there is a way to compute the So what we want to do here is to say this probability by IK that we have right here, which is the probability that by IK is 1, which in English is the probability that XI was generated from component or group K, this is uh, W K times the normal take just one piece of it with the weight and I divide by the whole thing, the sum is going to be f of x. That is the expected value, the membership value. That gives me, including the weights, so I compute this thing here versus the whole thing. If this is, say, 70 out of 100, that means 70% it comes from this component. Now, those formulas, of course, have a lot more mathematical background that I'm giving you here. I want to make sure for people who haven't seen mixtures before, we get to some intuition, and then next time we do more mathematics. So the biggest part right now for you guys, the biggest challenge, I have to admit, that was the biggest challenge for me when I first studied mixture in college. I was in a math college, so we did it from the theory point of view, is to not confuse those things. To be clear, who is pi ik? That's a random variable that determines for each student whether it's a ds or cs, but it's unknown to me. But there is such a hidden variable, it's just I don't know its value. So from my point of view, that's a random variable. From the registrar point of view, it's not a random variable. Don't know exactly who is ds and who is cs, but I don't know, right? Then there is the expected value of that, which is I think 60% likely you are a CS and 40% a DS. For him, maybe it's 60% a DS and 40% a CS, you know? So I can count these estimates. And there's, there's a mixture function who says, uh, we didn't talk yet about who's W1 and who's W2. What do you think W1 should be if I look at this class and say, I have so many DS students, so many CS students? The density is both sum to one, or integrate to one. What should W1 versus W2 be? Fractional squares. How many DS, how many CS, right? If I have a class of 99.9999 DS students, the, this, the density of skills, this is the density of programming skills for DS students, that won't change. 
is saying the same density, what will change here? If I want a class only with these students. W1 will be 100%, W2 will be zero. That, that I'm back to one distribution, everybody's DS now. If I say I have a class only with CS students, W2 will be 100%, W1 will be zero. But the actual distribution of skill programming skills for computer science students will be the same. That makes sense? Try to make this analogy with salary or house prices or, or you know, so many other things, car brands, I don't know. Okay, so now we've done one important concept, which is if we think that data is close to the mean, which most data is, but not all data. We said earlier there's some examples where clearly these distributions won't work because most of the points are not at the mean. But for a lot of data, that's true. How do we move from data that comes from one group or one density or one generation to data that comes from two groups? Right? What happens if I have a class that has DS students and CS students and literature students? What do you think programming skills for those literature students will look like? They're probably Gaussian right here, right? <laughs> Woo! That's okay. I mean, that's, that, you shouldn't laugh at them because the way they have programming skills that way, you, you probably know literature the same way like they know programming. So everybody has good parts and bad parts, you know? My wife, for example, knows absolutely no mathematics at all, but she cooks amazing. Right? I, I couldn't even, like, like me. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, it's quite possible that if we include non-technical students, that do, they do take computer science classes. Some university now have, have computer science classes for all majors, not just for <coughs> technical majors. Right? Of course, they'll be, the mean will be way on the other side. But now I have three groups. right? And by adding groups and Gaussians, I can model better the data that I have. If I have these literature students, they probably wouldn't fit at all. I would get skills over here, a lot of densities here, right? Because of the group of literature students. I would have high frequencies in here, but I couldn't model with these Gaussians those frequencies. Those Gaussians will tell me they should be really low, the frequencies here, but my observation of data will be that no, it's not that low. There's quite a few students who have these particular zero skills. So if that happens, I know my model's wrong. My model's telling me at this skill level, you should have almost no student. But I noticed in my class there are 30% of the students in here. That means my model is, just doesn't fit the data. I have students coming from a category that's not being modeled by those two things. That immediately tells me I need at least another Gaussian, if not something else. Right? Too much data that doesn't correspond to my model. So that brings me to another issue data that fits or doesn't fit the model, which is a big, big concept. So that's one done in there. Another one that we need, uh, let, let me just say this one that I have in mind right now, the concept of likelihood of data versus a model, of course, or given a model. So what happens here, in here, and in here, I came up with the model for how frequent my uh, programming skills values should be, right, in my class. Let's say for CS, it's probably that distribution for DS, that distribution for literature is that distribution, right? I have a model. I estimate, I, I somehow find out the right mu's and the right sigmas here from, say, previous data or from EM algorithm. But then I get a class next term with a lot of students, right? And I notice that this model doesn't fit. Because again, the model tells me I shouldn't have too many values here, but I notice a lot of values in here. Or I, I, I notice the model fits really well. Because if I start plotting the frequencies in the data, they actually match this distribution. So how do we make this mathematical, this notion that the model fits the data or doesn't fit the data? That is the concept of likelihood. Observe likelihood of data. Now, if you took a machine learning class, you already saw this because you can't do machine learning without likelihoods. But if you didn't, 
that's the, it's, this is a very probabilistic model function. So this is, uh, it's typically a product for all data points of the probability of that data point given the model parameters. So in other words, for me, given all the mu's and sigma's and w's and everything I have, what is the probability to observe a certain skill? X, X will be programming skill, right? Okay, X the value is programming skill. So what's the probability to observe that programming skill? Now, if that probability is very low, that's okay if I have only few data points that way. I could have a student that doesn't fit the model, but it's one student out of a thousand. That probability will not count too much. But once I see a lot of students that don't fit the model, then th this value starts being bad for me. So <coughs> this is the likelihood. What people do, and I should, we should do it from the very beginning, they don't actually do likelihood, they do log of likelihood, log likelihood right? So they take the log of it from the beginning. So if we take the log of this, what's going to happen? Sum becomes a sum of all data points of log of p of xi given the model parameters. We should say that um, for us, of course, that would be a sum over data points, log of the probability, I have to erase this a little bit here. This is params. So that is going to be a sum of log of what? Our probabilities are given by the normal functions or the normal mixtures, right? So let's say here, this is the function f in that point x, given mu's and sigma's and w's and whatever else we have as our parameter. So this is the probability of seeing that data point, xi value, given all the parameters I have. Now if I have one Gaussian, I'll have one mu and one sigma, and f will be exactly this the probability density function of a Gaussian. And I would have no W, right? Because if I have one Gaussian, that has 100% <coughs> of the weight. Now if I have two Gaussians, I'll have two mu's and two sigma's and two w's, right? And I compute that for a point, I take the log, I sum up those logs. If the data fits the model, what's going to happen with this value? We go up or down? No. If the data starts fitting the model really well, what's going to happen with those Fs, which are probabilities? These are probabilities. They start going up or down? Up. If the data fits the model, probability should go up. So the log of them should go up. I think what you meant to say is that this value will always be negative. Even though it goes up when it fits and down when it doesn't fit, it's always negative. Why is that? Log of the probabilities are below one, which means the log is But it does, does follows up and down like you'd expect to. High probabilities will be negative because everything is negative, just a little higher. Lower prob the, the higher this is, the more it fits the data. So you'll see this in a lot of data science machine learning. Of course, with different functions. Not all functions are Gaussians. The way we compute this likelihood depends on what kind of model we have. In the Bayesian model, we usually don't use Gaussian distributions. We could, but we could use any density functions in Gaussian model. In fact, the whole point of Bayesian models, or naive Bayes models, is that it allows me to not make an assumption about the data. It just says, at some point, figure out from counts directly the histogram of data. Like You don't need to make an assumption. So then if I use a Bayesian na naive base approach, even if you don't know what it is, you can believe me that in naive base, this kind of magical algorithm, I don't need to make 
a shape assumption, like data has to be around the center. I can just count in data what happens. Because the naive base algorithms makes other assumptions to allow me to do this. This is the exact opposite. This Gaussian mixture distributions do not make the assumption of independence, but they have to make an assumption of the shape of the data. It's concentrated around the mean. I can make that parenthesis right now. In generative models that using data, we have to make one of these two assumptions. Either, in fact, some assumption. The main two assumptions are either some independence. Independence allows me to break probability into products. You guys know that? Independence means P of x, y is P of x times P of y. Let's say x1 and x2. If I make this assumption that data features or whatever are independent, I don't need to assume nothing about the shape, the distribution of one of them, because I can count it in data. I don't need to make an assumption of salaries. I can just look at my data and look at the histogram of salaries if I want. If I don't make this assumption, which Gaussian mixtures do not make. They do not make the independence assumption. That's good. But then you have to make a shape assumption about the data. If you don't make any assumption, you will need a huge amounts of data to infer the, the distributions, the histograms, and the computation will be impossible. You need exponential number of points for every value of every feature. So if you have 10 features, and all of them have possible 20 values, the number of data points you need will be 2 to the 200 to estimate something without shape and without, without shape and without independence assumptions. Not to mention that computation to deal with that data would be impossible. So in all machine learning density generative methods algorithm, we typically make one of three assumptions. Either that the something is independent, allows us to break into much lower dimensionality. That's naive base. But then we don't need to make the shape assumption. Naive base can just count from data. Or we don't make the independence assumption, but then we have to assume something about the data, how it looks in shape, like it's Gaussian or exponential or Poisson distributed or gamma distributed or something. Or we make strong conditional assumptions. Uh, that's where these graphical models come into play that we don't even teach them in machine learning. You need an advanced machine learning class to do that. Uh, graphical models, it's not an independence assumption. It, it's an assumption that says this variable depends exactly on x1 and x3 and x5. This other variable depends exactly on this and this and that. And we can solve those models, so-called belief networks, by using conditional assumptions. If you want, this is a very basic notion of conditional assumption that says nothing is conditional to anything else, everything is independent. This is called the naive base algorithm. We're not gonna get there. I just wanna make this parenthesis for generative models. To get the model, you need an assumption about the data. The ones that we're doing here is the shape assumption. So, the last piece we need, notice that I put a thing here, empty spot. We need something in more than one dimension. This Gaussian here, it's 1D, right? This mixture is also 1D. Big confusion uh, in all these classes is the confusion between the components, like two, and the dimensionality of the data. This is still a 1D plot. It's just two or three, if you include the literature students, there's three components, it's still only 1D. What's the D in here? Yeah. The X, right? Which is, in my case, programming skill. That's a value, right? Is it a 1D value? Programming skill is like some number between 0 and 100? Yes. Now, I made a model that with three components, or four, or five, or two, or one. It doesn't change the fact that I model one dimension. It's just the, the histogram of that dimension, it's complicated, that requires three Gaussians. But of course, data is not one dimensional. Unless I make this assumption, if I make this assumption, I take my data and I break it into per dimensions. 
But the whole point of Gaussians is to not make this assumption. So I need a multi D Gaussians. So I want this nice belt curve to not be 1D, but to be 2D or 3D or 784D. I need it to work in all the dimensions. Dimensions of the data. Now we're going to study all kinds of things about dimensions. Currently, we use the raw dimensions as data comes. Three weeks later, or a month from now, we, we're going to use different Ds. But at least for now, we can't use 1D if my image has 784 dimensions. What good would that do? Right. So how do we do this? How do we write down this formula here? Right? For a, for a multidimensional Gaussian. Let's see if I can find it. So it's the same formula, we just need to expand it from 1D to many D. So if this works for one dimension, imagine uh, people, right? Patients. And I only look at their blood pressure. Blood pressure is a number, it's one dimensional. Or if I look at programming skills, that's one dimension. But now my students may have all kinds of other features, right? Classes they took, grades grade they, they have, you know, background, who knows what. How do I expand this Gaussian formula into multi-dimensions? Who's mu now? Who's sigma now? And who's x now? So this is a vector, it's a d by 1, and remember x, the data point x is what? x1, x2, up to xd, it's a vector, if the image is this d is 784, right? Okay, so this is the d by 1, this is a vector, because when I average data points, to make this average work, when I average vectors of size 784, how big is going to be the result? A vector of 784, right? So this is a vector. X is X. It's a uh, 1 by D. <coughs> this is mean. Data mean. How about this? What is variance if I have many dimensions? So what is variance if I have one dimension? Do we know that? What is sigma squared? It is the expected value of x minus x minus the mean. That's the mu, right? Mu is a of x. Is it squared? Like that? Are we sure? Right, you should verify. But now, um, so let's write it like that, right? It's the expected value of x minus mu squared. Right? It's kind of how far away, on average, things are from the mean. What if I have many dimensions? Anybody know? So let's look at this matrix sigma. It's a formula. I'm going to erase this part here. I don't want to. But sigma will be a matrix d by d. And the, I have the dimensions here 1, 2, up to d. 1, 2, up to d. And on each component, say, uh, j to j in here should be the actual variance of that feature alone. So this is, if you look at just that um, blood pressure, right, or age or salary, whatever the pixel color, that is the variance of that, that feature. So this is like 1D, the 1D variance. So 
the diagonal it's easy. Those are each individual features, 1D variance. Same formula like that. But what about the rest? Covariance. Hmm? That is some sort of I'm not ready to put a math formula. I don't want to, you know, be very abrupt here. But I want to say it's some sort of dependency, right, between two features. If this is a cell on, say, I to J, this is some dependency between the feature I and the feature J, the data. If the blood pressure is correlated to the age, the covariance value between blood pressure and age will be non-zero. But if something, say the blood pressure versus the shoe size, they're not correlated variables, they're independent of each other, what's the covariance value gonna be? So for now, we don't want to use the formula, we don't wanna do too much math in one day, but we wanna say the covariance between feature I and feature J is small if and only if feature I and feature J are independent or almost independent. When is the covariance a very high value? When they are very predictable from one another. And where it's a very small value, but it's also predictable, but they're anti-correlated. So we're going to have to look a little deeper into what's covariance formulation. It's a very similar formula to this, but it includes two features, not just one. So it's a feature I and feature J. And but I, what I want you to understand, covariance has to do with how correlated features are. If they are independent, if I could do this like in naive base, break the features into independent, I would have no covariance at all. So sometimes people do that. Sometimes people say, I want to use a covariance matrix, but I'm going to assume everything is zero except the diagonal. That's essentially an independence assumption because there's no covariance. OK, so that's the sigma. And what about the formula? What is the formula? So what is the result of this thing? It's a number, right? Yeah which is the probability that this data point value came from this distribution. So in here it's still a number. It's the same. It's the probability now that this is not, this xi is not a number. This is a vector now, right? It's the whole data point. It's a whole patient. It's not just one blood pressure. It's all features that I have. So this is still the probability that xi was generated from uh, a normal distribution with that mean and that variance, right? So you can, I want you to think about intuitively that way. This is what's the problem that this patient comes from that group. But now it's not a unidimensional thing, it's multidimensional. And so what's the formula? Anybody can guess in here? What happens to this stuff? So sigma square becomes? I want to put a sigma here. That's my matrix. At this is what power if I write the whole thing? This is? Sigma is a replacement not for this sigma, it's a replacement for sigma square. So, so this is sigma, it's kind of like sigma square, it's variance. So this big matrix stands for sigma square. So this would be square root, I have to have a square root and it's one over, I think it's minus one half in here. Right? So the one half is the square root and the minus is because it's a denom denominator. But can you do a matrix of power minus one two? Right? I mean, that, that's just taking mechanically from the formula. The Q 
can you do that? Can you take a matrix at power minus one half? How about this? What is this? Determinant of the matrix. Maybe we can do that. Okay. Okay. How about this? Uh, this is a what power? Two pi. Is a what power? Minus one half, right? Mm -hmm. That becomes minus d by two. So d is who now? Number of dimensions. It be one if I only want have one dimension. Exponential stays. So I'm going to write it exp instead of e at the power. You can write this one exp. You put accolades. That means exponential at that power. So exponential of now what? There's a minus one half here that comes from one by uh, two, I think. Let's see. Here's what I'm going to write. X minus mu. Those are vectors. Sigma at minus one. X minus mu. Put a little t here. Let's see what this is. So who is sigma minus 1? That's the sigma square at the denominator. And in terms of matrices, what is sigma minus 1? Inverse. Inverse of the matrix. OK? Minus 1 half. I think I miss a minus here. Isn't there a minus in front of this? Yes. yes. So minus 1 half is minus 1 half. x minus mu is a vector x minus mu is this vector. By doing this product, I get the square here. But why do I have to put a transpose to one of them? Uh, to, get to get the dimensions right, right? So this is, now if it's transposed, it's going to be 1 by d. So I don't need a transpose here. This is d by d. And this has to be transposed here. It depends how you write it, right? Because this has to be d by 1 now to make the multiplication work. Uh, if you write it in row format like me, you put a transpose here. But if you write it in column format, you have to put a transpose here. This, these dimensions align only one way, and you have to multiply it that way. So this is a generalization of this in many dimensions. Hmm. What do you think? You can see now why the homework is delayed. <laughs> because trying to figure all this stuff out. Right, so, so for now we have a few new concepts, right, that we didn't have last week. One is this idea of softness, that the memberships that were 0, 1 before, now they are probabilities. We can think, still think of 0, 1 random variables. There is a hidden truth somewhere that we're never going to find out. But there is a probability associated with this, expected value. What's the chance of being in that class? So that becomes the soft membership. What about uh, this idea that uh, we want things to belong to several clusters? We're going to need a shape assumption or a modeling assumption. We're going to say there's a Gaussian. And the other thing that we need is that we need to do this in multi-dimensions, so all Gaussians have to be multi-dimensional Gaussians. Now, what about the algorithm? How do we change the algorithm? So, so speak k-means, right, type of algorithm. Can I still pick the centroids to start with somewhere in the data? Yeah, sure, no problem. Those would be my mu's. Those centroids would be naturally d-dimensional vectors because they're picked from the data. Right. So the, my data points are d-dimensional vectors. How about here? Computer membership. There is a truth, but that's not what I'm trying to find. I'm not trying to find pi i k hidden random variables because I can't find those. What I'm trying to find is this, right? So I have to modify this step here, compute membership. It's not going to be take the point associated with whoever's closer, which the center that's closer. I have to assign these PIKs 
to sum to one. It's not one of them is one and everybody else is zero. Now it's gonna be a distribution. So we need a formula for that. I think we already have it. The formula is gonna be this thing here. I can compute what's the probability of coming from each normal, because I have the mu's and sigmas. So one thing that we need to add here, we need the mu's and sigmas, right? We, the parameter's not gonna be just the means now, means and sigmas. Now that we have means and sigmas, that, that step there, the E step will be you compute the probability, we need also the weights. So that's another thing we need to add. We need the W. Because all of these are part of the model parameter. So we start with some big random points, maybe a sigma that's just unit diagonal, and some what weights would you choose for the, say, five components? How should we choose this W? So if I say start with five components, pick random five points of centroids, pick the sigma being one, 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 one on diagonal, zero on the rest, what should I do with the, the Ws, the weights, the mixture weights? Uniform. I do reasonable stuff. In here, I'll have to compute the memberships. I think I want to use this formula right here. But can I compute this formula for every point now? Can I fit in every point? get the numerators and dominate, the denominators and assign those as memberships. Do I have everything I need to do this? I do, after the initialization. So I get the pi case now, which are probabilities. Now what about this average? It's erased now, let's write it down again, what was it? So the average will become one. This I do the next step, which is now that I have the memberships in a probabilistic form, I will need to compute the mu's, but also the sigmas, and also the w's, right? So I want you to think of this, exclude the formulas. Formula will come next time. But I want you to think from a conceptual standpoint. If I tell you the, the, the memberships in a probabilistic fashion, how do you estimate the mu's and sigmas? And let's worry about the w's later on. Let's just say mu's and sigma. How would you do that? How would you do it if I tell you all the data points are from one Gaussian, like in the k-means, right? In k-means, I could tell for each Gaussian, just take the points that come from there, because those are hard memberships, 0, 1. Take those points, average them, right? That's what it is. But how would you do it now? If I tell you, for each student in the class, there is a certain probability to be in the basketball team. He is 80%, 20%, 10%, 5%, 100%, 90%, you know, for everybody. It's not a zero one thing. If it be a zero one thing, you take only the ones that go to basketball, average them, and get that mean, right? Now they are probabilistic, what do you do? You don't wait at average, right? You still average all the points, but somebody with a 90% PIK to be in basketball counts as 90%, and somebody with 5% counts as 5%. So I think that's the same formula like we had, right? Think about it. What was the formula? Sum of XIK times pi IK, right? Divided by sum of the pi IK. I think it's the same formula serves as a weighted average. In a black and white world, it was just selectors. These were like a filter. Only sum up the ones that go in. Now, you sum up everybody, but with different weights. Yeah. Right? How about the sigma? Sigma comes down to computing a covariance matrix into those things. We'll have to give you a formula. Do you have a question? Weight, right? change the weights. Yeah, the W's. So we, we're recomputing weights right now. So we have the mu's. We need a covariance formula that has this density probabilities, pi case. But then, let's keep that for a moment. What about W's? Who we said W's are? Do we have a formula here for W's? Who is this? Common sense. Who was this in the 
in K means? K means on a hard partition. Who's double in K? Number of points in a cluster. Well, now it's not the black and white thing. It's not like I know who's in that cluster, who's not. So who's WK going to be? Approximate. How do I tell in a probability sense? Nobody is black and white. Everybody has a probability to be in the basketball team. How do I measure the size of the basketball team as an expected value? I sum up those probabilities, right? So I think the W's are exactly those. The sum of the memberships for a particular cluster K, K is fixed now. It's exactly the W K. It's the sum of the memberships, which are fractional memberships to that cluster. Now the sum of uh, W's should sum to, if it's normalizing, this has to sum to one, I have to divide by n, right? Because in this form, they're gonna sum to n. Every data point will sum to one, so all data points will sum to n, but if I want it as a fraction, I have to divide by n. How many people would mean? Hands up, be honest. Okay, we, we're gonna intentionally split this into two lectures, so we can recap it slowly next time and add some math formulas to it. Yes? Uh, um, I don't really follow why W is essentially a sum of the cross ones of pi and K. Well, in, in, if pi and K are 0, 1, the sum of how many people on basketball team is the size of basketball team. Yeah. In here, you are 20%, I'm 60%, he's 90%. If I sum up those percentages, I get the expected size of the basketball team. I mean, that gives you like a sum of Hold on, guys, I have something to show you. Yes. That gives us a probability, sum of the probability, right? That's a well known thing in statistics. The sum of the probabilities added up is the expected size of the group. If you say, how many people are likely to vote with Democrat candidates? You're 20%, 60%, 90%, 80%, so on and so forth. You say, what's the expected number of votes that the candidate gets? Is the sum of these probabilities. Let me show you this stuff a little bit to make more sense. Are we, why is everybody leaving? Is it done? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet, right? OK. I don't mind people leaving. I just don't want to be super late. Dimensional Gaussian, nice and round in all sides, right? MATLAB allows me to rotate this to see, to look at it wherever I want. It's like a bell just in two dimensions instead of one, right? Okay, that's nice. Now suppose I use the same Gaussian, I have a code here. The reason it's so nice is because it's sigma covariance matrix right here is what? One, zero, zero, one. This is a diagonal matrix, right? It has the one individual sigmas and zero covariances. What happens if I take this and I say, uh, make it this? This is still zero covariances. You have to learn how to read this matrix. This is the first row, second row. So it's still zero covariance. But now one variance is not one, the other one is one. So if I run this, What happens? What's the difference now? In one way, it's white. Which way is white? Large variance. But the other way is narrow because it has a small variance. That's the 0.25 variance. The other size is not one. But it's still aligned with the axis. You see how each, each dimension is perfectly aligned with x and y? Why is that? There is no. There's no covariance. covariance. What happens if I add covariance? Now, my, my x and y's are not independent anymore. 
See, my matrix now has the same variances as before, but there's some covariance values. Covariance have to be symmetric. Otherwise, it doesn't work. The dependency of feature one or feature two is the same as the feature two or feature one. Once you see the covariance formula, that's going to make sense. What happens if I run this now? It's still skinny one way and white the other way, right? White, skinny, but it's not perfectly aligned on the axis because there is a dependency between the two features here. So if you look at the footprint, that's called a footprint, looking from the top, it's not aligned with the axis. From the side, you can tell it's oriented somehow. Right? That's one Gaussian in two dimensions. Okay, what if we work on a, on a mixture here? So the first sigma, there's two sigmas. This is a two-dimensional, uh, two components, I think. And they have one identity matrix. One is this 5001. MATLAB is going to create this, this figure for me. How is this model going to look? It's in two dimensions, right? If I, what do I notice here? There's two bumps. One is taller. One is shorter with a wider variance, right? And they all, both of them nice and round because they all have these, uh, these covariances matrices, right? So this is two bumps, <coughs> and I can look at them in different ways. It's 2D because of those variance matrices. Now suppose I change the sigmas, I leave the means alone, I change the sigmas. Um, One is aligned with the axis, the other one is not. And they both a combination of what you've seen before. Each one of them is what you've seen before, but now there's a mixture between them. And I have this mixture coefficients here, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Suppose I want to change those. Suppose I want to make them 0.7 and 0.3. Who are those pieces on the board? Those are the W's, right? And now, uh, one is better than bigger than the other, because I changed the weightage. Okay? So one more thing. What's happening here is I have three. I'm combining three Gaussians here with three muons and with three weights. So now I'm combining, still in two dimensions, but three components. So how is this going to look? There are three bumps now, right? And if you look from the side, you see how they mix up in the middle. In the middle, we get this, this here in the middle, is this middle here where a probability could come from all, either one of the three of them, right? And I can play with these Gaussians to say, okay, um, what about, Yes, if I try to add here some covariance, I can't add too much. This matrix have a property. It's called <coughs> semi-positive definite. It is not that property. We can discuss what that means. He won't be able to plot it. But this is did. So of course, if I add covariance, it's going to change the orientation of some of them a little bit. It's not going to be aligned with the axis. So. That's the intro, and that's the most important, the conceptual parts. You're not going to remember all these formulas or all your code and everything you do for the homework, but you have to remember that Gaussians do not make an independence assumption. I can have the covariance to control dependencies. They make a very strong shape assumption. I can use more than one to model more interesting shapes, because one Gaussian is very limited to that one shape. But if I add 10 Gaussians, I can get a very bumpy surface if I want to. Right? And then the EM algorithm still works like in K-means. One step we have to estimate parameters, mu, sigma, W's. The other step is to estimate the membership, which is now soft. All right. More details on Wednesday. <laughs>